Okay, uh, before we get on to today's lecture, I just wanted to mention uh, one of the, I'm going to go through more of the questions later on. Hopefully this uh, the new bit won't be, will, won't take more than about an hour and then I'll spend the rest of the time talking about answering questions that came up and then either, you know, the, the ones I've selected from what you've written, but also if you have questions uh, now, you can answer them. But uh, one of them that was, uh, that was written in last week's uh, collection was um, kind of challenging the, the, the metaphor used in the words anaphora and cat, cat, cataphor, uh, you know, anaphor and cataphor, uh, where they're saying it doesn't make sense to call anaphor uh, looking up and cataphor looking down. But it just happened on Monday's class, my, other, my fourth year class, I have them write something every week also, and this, this week, Somebody handed this in and saying, oh, talking about constructions or observed whose syntactic semantic properties cannot be derived, so and so and so and so, based on up arrow, right? So this is exactly the same metaphor as anaphora, uh, right? So anaphora meaning look up. Uh, so here it's like, you know, or carry up. Um, and that four is the same, it, you know, we say anaphora, that doesn't work. Uh, so we have an aphora, the same root, the fur or for uh, root is used in a lot of words. It, I mean, literally means to carry or to bear on your back or to, in some cases, take. But you have like an aphora and you have a, a cataphora, cataphora, but you also have 
this is Greek. You also have in Latin, you have infer and refer. So in, when we say to infer something, that's in logic that came from the idea of carrying it back in, uh, carrying in. Carry, so the fur is the, just the Latin pronunciation of the four. Um, and then the refer means to carry it again. So re means again. So, so this means to carry it again. This means to carry it in. And there's an, a lot of the words that use you know, the same root uh, to carry. Um, and so it's just, you know, a lot of times the words we use there, we don't see them as metaphorical because they're Latin or Greek and we don't necessarily, um, you know, know where, where the, the origin, what the origin is. But anyway, I thought this was a very nice uh, kind of thing where this person used this as, a, as an anaphoric device, uh, making it very clear that in order to understand the reference, you have to look back up in the text, right? So that's what an afro, that's the, and, and that's, those are the standard words in going way back in, uh, you know, traditional grammar even. So these are not something Halliday made up. That's just, uh, you know, standard reference. Okay, so today we're talking about another four. Uh, we're talking about metaphor, which is meta, it means uh, beyond. Or, and, or um, sometimes after. Uh, so it, in the word, um, like we have like uh, metaphysics, if you've heard the, the term metaphysics, the reason why metaphysics is called metaphysics is because in the order of Aristotle's books, it came after physics. So it was beyond physics, so it was called metaphysics. And so it's later on people misunderstand where that word came from. But metaphor just means to carry beyond or carry above or carry uh, across or, you know, later kind of means to, to change. So what the idea is that a metaphor, when it was originally conceived, was that you're using one thing in place of another. Um, and the thing is now we understand metaphors to be a very crucial part of how we actually understand the world, how we structure our, our way of thinking. They're, they're not just seen as some poetic, uh, you know, kind of mechanism we can use when we want to sound really poetic, uh, but they're actually how we, con how we conceive of the world, how we structure our way of understanding the world. Um, and so there's quite a lot of work in linguistics on metaphor. Uh, and Halliday's taken this a little further, not just lexical metaphors, like he's a pig, um, but looking at how even the use of grammar uh, in certain cases is metaphorical, you know, using... So basically the idea is you have a form that um, lexicalized or grammaticalized, you know, in other words, came into being for one use, being used for another use. So like we normally use the word pig for referring to a, you know, a little animal. And then we use it to, uh, to refer to a person that we think has the characteristics of that pig. Of course, those are all very culturally oriented. So like a, in Chinese, if you call somebody a pig and, you call, uh, and in English, when you call somebody a pig, the meaning is very different. In Chinese, when you call somebody a pig, it means they're stupid. In English, when you call somebody a pig, it means they're sloppy, not stupid. In America, we think pigs are smart. They're just sloppy, uh, like a lot of undergrads. But um, <laughs> just kidding. Uh, the, um, so the, these metaphors, um, have many metaphors have some become so part so much a part of the way we talk and the way we think we don't even recognize them put away your phones please wait i should have mentioned that first everybody put away your phones put away your computers away away not just on the table but away thank you um the they become so much a part of our way of thinking that we don't even recognize them as metaphorical anymore and it takes like this is from warp in 1940 and already, you know, a lot of these things, like he said, I grasp the thread of another's arguments, but if its level is above my head, my attention may wander and lose touch with the drift of it, so that when he comes to his point, we differ widely, our views being indeed far apart, uh, so far apart that the things he says appear much too arbitrary, even a lot of nonsense. Now, in this passage, every one of those things in quotes is a metaphor. But if you, you know, most people, if they would read this, they, they wouldn't even notice anything really metaphorical about it because we're so used to 
talking in this way, and this was even in 1940, it's even more so now, it's become, because these things over time become more and more conventionalized. And so all of these things, we, we don't even recognize um, pretty much uh, that they are metaphorical unless we really think hard about it. And of course, different cultures use different metaphors and so see the world differently because what a metaphor does to some extent is it helps you to structure your way of looking at something, but it, by doing that, it emphasizes certain aspects of it and downplays other aspects of it. So it actually influences how you understand the phenomenon you're talking about. Um, so they're really important. So say, for example, uh, one of, some of the early work on this was by George Lakoff and uh, Mark Johnson in a book called Metaphors We Live By in 1980. It's a very small book, very quick read if you're interested, um, where they talk about things like argument. We cannot talk about having an argument unless we use words related to war. So we talk about, you know, demolishing his argument or putting up a good defense and all these other things. We don't have a way of talking about arguments except as if it's a war. And so there, that's why they say it, it actually structures our conception of the, war, of the world. And he, George also, George Lakoff, uh, wrote some really brilliant stuff where he showed, he's, he's very active politically, showing how when leaders, like say for example, when uh, the first George Bush was trying to bring the country to go to war in the Middle East uh, against Saddam Hussein, that he used particular metaphors to kind of, you know, highlight certain aspects of what he wanted to do and downplay the negative and other parts of the other thing and so was able to achieve his purpose by playing with these metaphors. Um, and you know, then they came up with this whole war on terror, they came up with um, a lot of the other things. And, and he later on became the darling of the Democrats because uh, he, he has another book called uh, uh, Don't Think of an Elephant. Because of course if you say don't think of an elephant, you think of an elephant. Um, and he also has a book called Women, Fire, and Dangerous Things, which is one category in, in the Australian language, Dearball. Um, but anyway, he, he was uh, very popular with the Democrats recently before, somewhat um, a few years ago before the uh, Obama election because he was telling them, look, don't buy into the metaphors that the Republicans are using because once you've bought into their metaphors, you've lost the game. You have to kind of unpack that. You have to get away from the way they're framing the whole discussion because once you frame the discussion in a particular way using particular metaphors, you're stuck in that way of thinking. And so they had to completely come up with different ways of talking about things. And it, you know, it was very effective. That's one of the reasons why Obama got elected. Um, what metaphor you use and even what term you talk about when, when a phenomenon reflects your construal of that phenomenon, so it highlights certain aspects of the phenomenon as opposed to others. And this can influence your perception of a situation and your action in that situation. So here's what I'm mentioning, Lakoff and Johnson. Uh, in the, the book, the, they talk about the power of metaphor to create a reality rather than simply to give us a way of conceptualizing a pre-existing reality. So these things actually get us to think in a particular way and lock us into a particular way of thinking. Now the use of metaphor is related to one of the principles that structures the clause and much of communication. We understand one thing by relating it to another. So this is, you know, as I talked about when I talked about the theme, you know, how the theme is often something that's already kind of understood, and then the ream is something that you're adding to the theme. You know, it's often a comment on the theme or some information you're adding to the theme. And so it's a, it's a standard, mainly the way we understand something is always by relating it to something we already know. And the way we make sense of something is by relating it to something we already know. So when you... Uh, when you want to understand a new phenomenon, you say, oh, it's you either use a simile, like, oh, it's like this. You know, so you eat some kind of new meat and you say, oh, it's like chicken. Or you, uh, um, you know, if some new phenomenon, you can either use a simile like with a like, or you can use a metaphor where you say, oh, it's, you know, a wave of something or other. So in science and whatnot, they will actually use these. When you talk about light as a wave or the wave light as a particle, that's really kind of a metaphor for talking about particular aspects of how it works, because light is not a wave and it's not a particle. It's actually, you can look at it from both directions. You can use both metaphors. It's actually a metaphor if we're looking at it. So you can look at light from the, the, using the metaphor of wave and make sense of certain aspects of it, but you can look at it from the point of view of particle and make sense of certain aspects of it. 
So um, it's very often important to use different ways of seeing things. In the case of metaphor, we understand one thing by saying it is the same as something else. So in saying a tidal wave of emotion swept over me, I'm trying to get you to understand the number and strength of emotions. So when you say a tidal wave, it's like you know something really big, like a tsunami kind of thing uh, of emotions, like lots and lots of or you know huge emotions swept over me, and you know just like a wave sweeps over you. Um, and you're trying to know, to get you to understand the number and strength of emotions. So this is to some extent you know kind of a hyperbole, you know, saying uh, kind of to an extreme degree. But you're using a, a metaphorical way to do that. Um, you know, it's, it's like a irresist uh, um, make you think like a large irresistible force. Um, and this is the equivalent of an intensive relational clause. The emotions were a tidal wave, um, or the emotions were like a tidal wave if I was to use a simile. And in this case, you'd use a circumstantial relational clause of comparison. But the metaphor generally seems more powerful, so we will use that if we can, if we, if we think it's important. Now, if you'll notice, when we say a tidal wave of emotion swept over me, it's not just one word, tidal wave, uh, but you have to put that then into a whole construction where you know, the, 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 the wave of emotion swept over me. So it's really the whole construction that is part of expressing the metaphor. It's not just a single word. Traditionally, in, in um, poetics, they often talk about metaphors as just single words, but it's really the whole construction that goes with it. And this is part of the brilliance. This, the chapter in the book on this is really very good. Michael, this is where you can kind of see the brilliance of Michael Halliday. This one and some of the other ones, like the chapter on clause complexes, I think is just so brilliant. Um, uh, not close come it's close come but also the group complexes where he talks about especially the verbal complexes it's just the brilliance of this guy is just so amazing um, other non-literal forms of speech often subsumed under the general bread of metaphor we have metonymy and synecdote. Uh, um, so it, sometimes people lump these together sometimes they separate them but in metonymy you refer to something by reference to something that's related to it so if a waitress in a, in a canteen or you know, a, a restaurant says something like, the hamburger also wants a side of chips, uh, of course it's not the hamburger, but he's, she's using that to refer to the person who ordered the hamburger, saying that the, the person who ordered the hamburger also wants a side of chips. Or somebody explaining another strange behavior by saying he's in his cups, you know, means he's drunk. Uh, or referring to the king as the crown, uh, or the military leadership in the U.S. as the Pentagon. Now, the Pentagon is actually a building, but we often talk about the military in the U.S. as the Pentagon, as if the building, you know, represents that. Where it does, we use the building to represent them, or the crown to represent the king or queen. Um, and so, Halliday or, or analyzes, uh, analyzes this as a type of circumstantial relation and gives the examples like, you know, if you say something like, "Keep your eye on the ball." Uh, that would be the metaphorical way of saying it. And then it's something like saying the gaze is directed from the eye. Or when you say you bear your heart, it means the, the feelings are located in the heart and you're kind of showing them. Uh, it won't happen while I still breathe. Uh, with living, you know, is assuming that living is maintained by breathing. So you're, um, uh, by Act, by using this metaphor, you're kind of activating those senses over there. Uh, synecdoch is where a part is used to refer to the whole, or less commonly, the whole is used to refer to the parts. So when you say, like, many hands make light work, of course, it's not just the hands. It's like many people. But we, we use the word hands to refer to the people who are doing the work. Or 10 head of cattle, like we say head of cattle. Um, and a lot of the classifiers in Chinese come from this, to, like, you know, yi wei yu. Uh, you use a part of the animal to refer to the whole animal, uh, so ten head of cattle. cattle. Uh, the military to refer to two ships of the Navy uh, in the newspaper headline, military bound for East Timor. Um, and this derives from a kind of circumstantial relation of the possessive type. So cows have heads, the military has soldiers and sailors, so you can use you know, the part to refer to the whole. Um, now, we think of these figures of speech, so to, they call this, traditionally they're called figures of speech, uh, as variants which replace a more unmarked, straightforward expression. 
they're really just a different way of saying. Now, in many discussions of these, you'll talk about a literal way and a, and a metaphorical way, but Halliday avoids using literal. He just used congruent, uh, which just means what he calls co-representational. In other words, they can both be used to represent the same state of affairs. So if I, you know, if I want to say he's, uh, he's sloppy or I say he's a pig, they're kind of saying the same thing, but in different ways, right? And they, of course, when you say something different, you mean something different. So they're not synonyms. There's really no such thing in synonyms as in language. When you say something different, you mean something different. Uh, or the person will understand something different, even if you intended them to be the same. Um, so the, it's just that there are two options. As he talks about in the book, you, you have, you know, um, you remember we talked about all those layers, so you have the kind of the, the sense of the meaning that you want to convey, and then that can be represented in the wording, and then the wording can be represented in the phonetics or in the writing. So in this case, you have your choice. Again, it goes back to having a choice. So when you have this particular meaning you want to express, you can choose what kind of wording you want. You can either have a metaphorical meaning or the, the congruent meaning means some other way of saying it. And there, it isn't just a one-to-one -one also, it's, there may be different possibilities, a uh, number of different possibilities. So like when you do the tutorials this, this evening or this afternoon, um, you know, there isn't just one correct answer. There's a number of different ways you could say the same thing because they're just different possibilities for saying the same thing. Uh, and uh, each of them will have different effects when you use them. So again, it goes back to this whole question we started with is you know, having choices but realizing that your choices will have consequences in terms of what meaning is conveyed. So like using a metaphor, as I mentioned, will highlight certain aspects and downplay others. But if you go back in the very beginning of uh, the course, uh, somebody brought up the fact that when you say things in a very straightforward, so-called flat way, what Michael Halliday calls flat way, you know, the congruent way, where it seems like, uh, you know, you don't use any metaphors, you don't use any moving things around or whatever, then it's very boring. So the idea is, you know, sometimes you use metaphors just to spice it up a bit, make it seem, you know, more interesting or more powerful or whatever. So each of these are just choices that you have. If you just want to be straightforward and clear, you can use one thing um, and one way of saying it. Or if you want to be fancy, you can use a different way of saying it. So it's not that you have literal and metaphor, but just different possibilities. Uh, so they're related to meaning, but not totally synonymous. Um, and the, the metaphorical form, when you choose it, is chosen precisely because of the extra semantic uh, features or angle that it takes on the, the thing you're talking about. Um, OK, I already talked about that. So there are different types of metaphors. Uh, there is experiential metaphors and interpersonal metaphors. Uh, and so when we. Uh, looking at these, you know, in, in lecture four, we talked about how when you uh, want to express something, you pick a process, and then along with that process, you're going to have different uh, participants. So if you pick a material process, there's going to be an actor and, an under, and a goal. And if you pick a mental process, there's going to be a sensor and a phenomenon. Um, but what can, you can do sometimes with uh, metaphors is you can take a process that you might represent in one way and present it as another. So say, for example, you, you take something that you might present as a, a, a mental process, but then metaphorically present it as a material process. And I'll give you some examples. In the book, he gives the example of, you know, Mary saw a wonderful sight, which is be mental, but she said, a wonderful sight met Mary's eyes, where you turn it metaphorically into a material process, you know, to meet your eyes meeting something where she's, you know, it's kind of metaphorical to say her eyes did it when it's really, you know, you mean her. But then, um, and then also, you know, saying that uh, the, the sight met her as if the sight was doing something. Um, so we talked about these, uh, we analyzed the experiential structures being based around the process types. As I already said this, okay. Um, so we were, when we did all of those other uh, discussions, we were assuming a straightforward and typical relationship of meaning and form. And so if we wanted to present the idea that Mary saw something wonderful, then 
this process of perception would be realized as process plus sensor plus phenomenon. Um, and so we'd have Mary saw something wonderful with sensor process and phenomenon. Um, but we don't have to use that. So we can say a wonderful sight met Mary's eyes where we have the actor and goal. Uh, in this case, we can compare the two expressions and see that the sensor of the more congruent expression is expressed as the possessor of the eyes, you know, Mary's eyes. So Mary ends up as just the possessor of the eyes. Uh, with the metonymy of the eyes representing Mary's gaze. So here we're using both metaphor and metonymy. Uh, and uh, in the process of the more congruent expression, the uh, uh, seeing is expressed as a participant, the nominalization, that's the wonderful sight, uh, with the modifier of the phenomenon now modifying this nominalization. And the process in the metaphorical expression has no correspondence. Uh, in this thing. So if we look at, um, you know, if we're just comparing this, so in the book he, he puts, puts them together to show you the, the, the different analyses. Uh, the point is that, you know, there's going to be a lot of moving around of the different types of participants. Um, and you do this for particular reasons. So it, it depends on what you want to be um, the theme, and especially if you want it to be the unmarked theme, which is the subject, then you sometimes have to move things around. So like the example he gave in the book about uh, on the fifth day, or, or the fifth day saw them reaching the summit, the fifth day saw them reaching the summit, where you know, normally fifth day would just be a, a circumstantial element, but by using this metaphorical expression, you make it a participant and you actually make it the theme, the unmarked theme as the subject, the, the fifth day saw them at the summit. summit. So if your thematic progression is in terms of these time periods, then you might want to do that. So that might be one motivation, for example, for using the metaphorical expression. Um, so in this case, we also have these things like when we have with the range, uh, many of these range expressions are in metaphorical uh, or can be analyzed as metaphorical. So when we talk about range is actually a normalization of the activity. Now, so normalization of a normal of a process is itself a kind of um, uh, a, a metaphor because something that's an activity you're representing it as a participant, right? So it, already that's metaphorical. Uh, and then the main verb is is cognitive form or a light verb. So to have a chat to build or take a bath, do a dance, sing a song. So these are also one kind of experiential metaphor. Another, kind is what, another type is when an attributive sense is expressed as a possessive process. So I mean, this is something that most people would not think of as metaphorical, but when you say he has a big nose, when really um, the agnate form is his nose is big. But here's a clear case when you, you, want, you don't want to really make his nose a, the, the, the unmarked theme, the subject, so you want to make him the unmarked subject. So how do you do that? Well, you move this around so that he becomes the unmarked theme. And then the, the attribute ends up just as a modifier, an epithet of the, the thing, right? So rather than saying his nose is big, you say he has a big nose uh, or she has a nice smile. So this is also a kind of um, metaphorical type of thing. And, and the main reason for this type of thing is just so you can make this the the unmarked theme. Um, and these, these things per permeate our, our language to the point that many of them have become so common like these that we don't even recognize them as metaphorical. Uh, and they may even become the unmarked way of expressing something. So over time, there's nothing in language that says it has to be this way or that way. Everything is open and free and loose. And so metaphorical expressions often sometimes become the normal way of saying something. So it doesn't mean it's not metaphorical anymore. It just means that's the normal way of saying it. Um, uh, just like, you know, he's, his nose, he has a big nose. Um, and so when we come across, if we're analyzing text and we come across an, a metaphorical expression, you can analyze it as it is, like we did in the, the example uh, here, um, like this one, you know, a wonderful site. Or, um, you can unpack it to see what, con re uh, what congruent rewording we might find, or you can do both. Um, now, in those cases, 
uh, it's not that you're necessarily going to say, oh, this really means this, because the person, the writer, would have picked the metaphorical expression because they wanted that particular way of expressing. But or in order to understand what the metaphor means, it often helps for you to kind of think about, all right, what, what is this really saying? Uh, and you'll do that, you'll practice this when you do the, the tutorials, because some of these things are like kind of opaque. And so you have to kind of pick apart, okay, what is this really saying? And then once you do that, you, sometimes you surprise yourself that the meaning you end up with is something different from what you originally, you know, you first thought. And so I mentioned this one already, the fifth day saw them at the summit, uh, which is the same thing as saying they arrived at the summit on the fifth day, but here, you know, the normal way would have the fifth day at the end of the clause uh, rather than as the unmarked theme. So again, you might pick the, uh, the metaphorical one just so you can get the fifth day as your unmarked theme. Or if you wanted to have the summit in the unmarked kind of new, new information position, which is the end of the clause. Um, if you analyze the metaphorical clause alone, it would be ignoring the fact that it's metaphorical. Um, in this case, like with a temporal location as sensor. So the fifth day saw, you know, usually when you have a, uh, a mental verb like this, it's going to be... Um, uh, a sense of the sense is going to be animate, so it's kind of very strange that way with the mental process clause. Um, but if you, you know, if you analyze it as the congruent form, that's not actually what the person said. So to stay loyal to what we said, but at the same time unpack the more congruent meaning, then you can do a double analysis uh, like this. So where you, you're, this is what was actually said. The fifth day saw them at the summit. This was kind of the unpacked meaning. Um, and so you can analyze the, the actual analysis and also the, the metaphorical analysis. So you can get both of them. And then you can see how this saw is not represented at all in the, um, in the, in the, the congruent form. It's only in the metaphorical form. So you can see that the use of saw here is completely metaphorical. It's not representing any... Uh, any of the actual experiential meaning. And by doing this, you can sometimes, you know, contrast them and see if you can determine why the speaker chose the metaphorical expression over a more congruent expression. Um, and it also recognizes that actually when you say both of, when you say this, the metaphorical expression really has both meanings. Um, because when a, when a hearer hears this, of course they know that fifth day does not really see it, the su see the summit or see them at the summit, and they will understand it as this, right? But with you know certain um, extra meaning added or some at least textual. There's sometimes it's just for textual purposes, sometimes it's for meaning purposes. But the idea is that when you understand it, you actually understand both of them. Um, so here are some more examples uh, with both types. So I haven't had the benefit of your experience is the metaphorical one, which um, could be one, one congruent form would be, unfortunately, I haven't experienced as much as you have. Uh, so haven't had the benefit, again, this kind of um, possessive metaphor. Uh, advances in technology are speeding up the writing of business programs. Uh, because technology is getting people getting better, people can write business programs faster, right? So these are saying the same thing, but in very different ways. And they're both, uh, as we say, co-representational. In other words, they, they can be used in the same context, but they highlight different things. So in this case, you know, they probably mentioned um, technology getting better, uh, uh, you know, making advances in an earlier part of the text. And so what you often use these metaphors for, like this metaphor advances in technology is actually a metaphor by itself. Uh, you sometimes use that. It's very much used in scientific literature to in kind of encapsulate or to, to recoup or re-mention something that you mentioned earlier in a more full form. And so it's a kind of a shorthand uh, taking this, uh, you know, technology is advancing and making it advances in technology. And then Business programs are now being written more quickly, can be encapsulated as speeding up the writing of business programs. 
So this is, even though this looks complicated, this is really just a simple, uh, simple causal structure. And this is one of the things that distinguishes uh, reading, uh, writing uh, written text and spoken text. And Michael talks about this to, to a large extent too. Um, how you get much more higher um, lexical density uh, in the writing forms because they're doing this kind of thing, they're packing more into the noun groups uh, and verb groups, but particularly the noun groups, uh, even though the clause structure is relatively simple. Whereas in spoken speech, we usually have a low lexical density. In other words, very few words per noun group, but we have very complex clausal relations. These difficulties necessitated the allocation of one extra packer. Uh, because these tasks were difficult, they needed to allocate one extra packer. Uh, to add alcohol impairment to the problem of inexperience is an invitation to disaster. If someone who has not had much experience is also impaired by alcohol, something disastrous may happen. Uh, so again, these are only one possible way of understanding or different or representing the same situation in a different way. Uh, so this is not the only possibility. There are other possibilities. Now, as I mentioned, one of the most commonly used resources is this nominalization. So taking a process and treating it as a noun. Uh, that's what's called, that's what nominalization means. You, you kind of, something that would otherwise be a, um, a, a process, like they allocated one extra packer, you then represent it as the allocation of one extra packer. <coughs> so this is a very common uh, metaphorical thing. So metaphor here basically is just meaning using one, something that was, it's normally done this way, you do it a different way. So advances in technology rather than technology is getting better, or alcohol impairment rather than is impaired by alcohol. Uh, and in some cases, you know, the, the, meta, the, the uh, metaphorical form may not be as clear as the, the other one, but you use it for brevity and you use it for, especially in science, uh, it's, a, it's a kind of elitism where, you know, you, the, the in-group can write to each other uh, and understand what they're talking about. The congruent participants get uh, displaced by the metaphorical ones becoming the modifiers of the new participants. So like alcohol, becomes a classifier of impairment rather than being the, uh, the actor. Uh, and one extra uh, packer uh, and technology appear in preposition phrases, uh, w uh, which are post modifiers, they're qualifiers of allocation and advances. So when you say like advances in technology, this is just a post modifier of advances rather than being, uh, you know, the, the theme. And um, the same with the, the allocation. So it's actually changing, when you use these metaphorical things, it's changing the relationships of the elements to each other. Uh, and so that's why when you, when you read it, it's sometimes more difficult to understand because you have to kind of unpack that to figure out, okay, what does it mean by you know, alcohol impairment? Does it mean the alcohol is being impaired or the alcohol is impairing somebody else or you know, what's, what's going on there? Whereas, you know, somebody is impaired by alcohol, then it's pretty straightforward uh, what, what the relationship is. Um, okay, I mentioned this already. So if we look at the example, what I was talking about earlier about lexical density, we go back to our favorite uh, example in our first tutorial, given that presidential authority includes the power to send troops abroad, having a law that says Congress must approve all declarations of war does not stop the president from involving the U.S. in foreign conflicts. <sighs> That's actually a very simple, just XBA. That's all that whole thing is just, from a clausal point of view, that's all it is. And so there's a huge, you know, packing of, of things into the noun groups. Um, so all of the complexities in these noun groups giving the passage a lexical density of 17.5. That means each clause has 17.5 words in it. That's very, very high. Um, but this is typical of written text uh, where you, especially scientific text, you pack as much as you can into the noun groups uh, and the, the actual clause structure is very simple. 
Whereas if you uh, took a spoken version of this, if you said the president has the authority to send troops abroad, so although Congress must approve all declarations of war, that does not stop the president if he wants to send troops to fight overseas. If we look at it this way, the, the congruent way, then the, the lexical density goes down to only 8.25, but the clause complex looks more like this, which is you've got one, two, three, four, four clauses. Is that? Yeah, four clauses, and, and then the relationships among them. So, um, you know, there's always this uh, difference uh, we find between spoken and written language. Of course, even within written language, clear versus un less clear written language may also um, do this. And, and languages also differ to the extent that they, uh, sometimes this is called referential density, sometimes it's called lexical density, but how often you, uh, you know, how many nouns you can squeeze into, a, or how many words you can squeeze into a noun group. Um, so this is an interesting fact uh, about, about languages. But this is considered a type, you know, squeezing all of this stuff into the noun groups is considered a type of metaphor. So this would be the congruent way, this is more the metaphorical way. Uh, now, normalization, as I mentioned, is often used for textual purposes where you introduce a, con uh, a concept as a full clause, but then later encapsulate it uh, in a normalization to talk about as a participant, particularly as theme. So like if you say a marker can be changed in all the open databases of the same type. So you start off your, your text with this, and then later on, you want to refer to this. So instead of using an up arrow, you can say changing of the markers in this way. So you've got this noun phrase, noun group, which changing of the markers refers to a marker can be changed in all the open databases of the same type. Uh, so here they just encapsulated uh, the same meaning as in this whole clause in this one noun group. And you make it the theme of the next one. So it's, it makes for a nice progression if you're you know, talking about procedural type of thing. So, you know, um, you know, so first you, like, a, you know, even in some simple texts, you say something like you're making a bow and arrow, and you say, okay, so now you, uh, by doing this, you put, you attach the arrows to the, uh, the feathers to the arrow, and then you say, having attached the feathers to the arrow, then you go on to something else. So it gives you a nice progression in the text. Now, so those are the ideational metaphors. Any questions about ideational metaphors before we move on to the interpersonal metaphors? Okay, in interpersonal metaphors, in lecture two, we mentioned that clauses like in eight, uh, I don't think he will come, or I don't believe that he will ever finish, uh, it will ever be finished. Uh, I dare say he is a twit, isn't he? Uh, in these, we mentioned that those uh, might be seen as projecting clauses because they look like projecting clauses, but they can also be seen as a kind of modality and uh, analyzed as a kind of interpersonal theme. Uh, so over time, what started out as a, a projecting clause, so I don't think would have projected an idea, and I don't believe, again, would have projected an idea, or I dare say would have projected a locution. Uh, but over time, these things came to just have this interpersonal um, modality type meaning. So I don't think means it doesn't seem possible to me or I don't believe is kind of, I, well, I don't, I don't think, or I, I, I'm not sure. Uh, when you say, I don't believe that will ever be finished, means I, I'm not sure that that will ever be finished. Or I dare say he is a twit, is the same kind of interpersonal, just not really, you don't really mean I dare say, it just means like, you know, it, it's pretty sure to me uh, that he is a twit. So they have this interpersonal sense. So this is a grammatical metaphor of modality where the I think has a function of the modal of probability. So it's like if you would say probably he will not come, but instead you say I don't think he will come, right? Or, it, it, I mean, originally you could have said I think he will not come, but that kind of, because actually having the negative here shows that this has become more of a sense of modality than, uh, than an actual projecting clause. So you could, you know, you could analyze this as a projecting clause, and that's what I've done here. Or you could uh, see this just as, you know, this being the mood, part of the mood block, 
um, with the subject and finite as a, a, a modal um, element. So it makes it this uh, makes explicit the subjective nature of the probability. It's kind of like saying, you know, in my opinion, um, the polarity also shifts to the modal expression. You know, that's what I mean. The, 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 the negative comes here rather than saying he won't come. You say, I don't think he will come. Um, but it's not the thinking that's that's negated. You know, it doesn't really mean I don't think, right? Um, like in Chinese, you wouldn't say that. Uh, it sounds very funny in Chinese to do that. Uh, you can, you have to say, I think he will not come. Uh, and that's the way it was in English before, but now because this has become kind of more modal, then you can stick the negation in there because it's part of the kind of finite and modal. Um, so the, because the negation normally goes with the modality, so this is the motivation for the negative uh, moving like that. We often use gramma uh, grammatical metaphors of mood as well, as we talked about, that uh, we have grammatical mood like, you know, declarative, imperative, uh, interrogative, uh, which we talked about, you know, being marked uh, with the position of the subject and finite and, uh, or the having of subject and finite or not. And these are very often what we will do is use, say, for example, an interrogative to give an order. Uh, so in other words, instead of using an imperative like shut the door, I can use an interrogative like can you shut the door? Uh, so that's, that's a grammatical metaphor of mood, where I'm using the mood that was kind of developed for or, you know, con conventionalized for asking questions to give an order. Or sometimes you can also use, uh, you know, um, a declarative to give an order. So like, you know, officers will now wear hats in the mess. Uh, so even though that's a declarative, it can be taken as an order by those people who are affected by it. And, um, you know, all possibilities are, are, everything is possible, all different types of uses. So that's metaphorical because these things kind of grammaticalized or conventionalized for one use, but then you use it for something else. So in pragmatics, these are called indirect speech acts because, you know, when you, um, uh, like when you say, can you give me the time? And when you're asking, you're actually, tell, you know, you want the person to just say, give me the time, but you say, can you give me the time? Or um, do you have the time, right? You can use different types of questions. Uh, these things have also become so conventionalized that you can say, uh, can you please tell me the time? Where the please shows that the interrogative has become so conventionalized as an order that you then can put in please, the word please. Um, so, um, so you can also use a, uh, a declarative to ask a question like, so you were never there, right? When you're actually asking, were you there, <laughs> you know, were you ever there? Or using an interrogative to give them a command, uh, like, uh, can you open the window? Or an interrogative form to make a statement weren't you at the meeting with the sense of you were at the meeting, so you should know. So like if somebody asks a question about, like, or if, you know, you ask me a question about something I talk about in lecture, I could say, weren't you at the lecture? Meaning, you know, uh, you should know. Okay, so that's the, um, the interpersonal ones. And then there's textual metaphors, which is not something that Michael Holliday talked about, but uh, Jeff Thompson talked about in his book, for those of you who have been reading the, the Thompson book, he adds textual metaphor to the list of metaphorical expressions. Um, so what I want for Christmas is my two front teeth. These are the thematic equatives, which again, um, you know, they're basically, he's assuming that anytime you say something different from the usual, then it's metaphorical. So the congruent would be, I want two front teeth for, my Chris, for Christmas. I want my two front teeth for Christmas. But when you put it with uh, what I want for Christmas is my two front teeth. So you're changing um, uh, you know, to this particular nominaliza nominalization structure. So nominalization is generally a metaphor by itself. But then putting it into this uh, thematic equative is another way of um, expressing this meaning. So it's, he's assuming that's metaphorical for textual reasons. So it's textual metaphor. And predicated themes, the same thing. So it was John who ate the cookies is the same as saying John ate all the cookies. But um, in this case, you use, you use these for um, 
they were actually would respond to different questions. So uh, if you just said, I mean, in some, you could, if you asked who ate all the cookies, you could say John ate all the cookies, but uh, more clear would be to say it was John who ate all the cookies because putting John in this expression after the, the copula shows that that's the thing that's being emphasized. Um, and then the same thing here, you're putting the two front teeth at the end of the clause, which is the unmarked position for new information. So the reason why you do this, so this is why he says it's a textual metaphor, because you're doing this for textual purposes. Um, so we talked about these as what, we're changing what appears as theme. And so that's why he's considering these metaphor, because it's playing with uh, the textual uh, texture of the, of the text. <laughs> um, okay. All right. So, um, good. We're just right on time for the first hour. Any questions about this before we take a break? Okay, good. Thank you. 
let me up the volume here. I should have done this earlier. All right, so um, I've selected some of the questions uh, from, from the things you submitted. And we can go through, if you have questions about any of the other lectures, uh, we, can, we can pull up the uh, slides and go through anything else that you want to talk about. Um, so one of the questions was this, uh, this bit that I went through, uh, look, I'm getting my pen again. The difference between the ING form and the, um, so you have like ING versus the like two or bare form. So like, um, uh, like thinking versus to think. Or uh, like reaching versus to reach. Now, depending on the context, uh, there's a couple of questions about this. One is the difference, you know, does it really make a difference between these two? And the other question was, this is called the present participle. This is called, um, not so much this one, the, the, when you have the ED form, uh, like reached. That's the past participle. And so one of the questions was, uh, this is supposed to be a realis non-finite form, and this is the irrealis. Uh, this is the irre um, yeah, the realis is the irrealis non-finite form. But if it's a non-finite form, why is this called present participle, and why is this called past participle if they're not tense forms? But they, they, the reason why they're called that is because they're used in the, the present and past form. So, um, so in this case, you know, is reaching versus had reached. So it's not so much the form reached and reaching themselves uh, carries um, tense in the normal sense. Again, this is a difference between the way Halliday talks about it. For Halliday, this is marking a kind of tense, what he calls secondary tense. So when you have, uh, this would be present in present. Uh, if you say had been reaching, it would be present in past. Um, so. The, this is why he has this whole thing about present and past and present, you know, whatnot, because he does consider these a type of, of uh, tense, but secondary tense as opposed to the actual finite of the clause, which is the primary tense. Uh, so with this one, it's a little confusing. Uh, for, from Halliday, if you stick with Halliday's way of looking at it, then it's consistent. So this is uh, present and this is past. Uh, and so then calling it a past participle and a present participle is not problematic. But in other theories, as you go on, if you take morphology and syntax next year, then they're going to be also calling that present participle and past participle possibly, but they'll call that a kind of um, aspect more than anything, like the ING form as a kind of uh, is reaching as a progressive aspect. So it's a little confusing in linguistics. We don't have... In like linguistics is a relatively young and very complex science, so we don't agree on a lot of stuff. Uh, it's really, if I was to teach you only the stuff that we all agree upon, we would have been done in the first 15 minutes of the first lecture. Um, most of it is all still kind of very um, up for argumentation. So some some people talk about it one way, especially the terminology we you, you know. Um, the history of science, I, I don't know if I've talked about this before, but the history of science is a movement out of philosophy into a more empirical kind of testing approach, right? So initially everything was in philosophy. You just sat under a tree and you just said all kinds of stuff. Uh, and you didn't bother testing it. But then, you know, Galileo and other people, uh, uh, you know, started testing some of the things that these philosophers had said and found that they were actually wrong uh, in some cases. So like Aristotle had said that if you drop a heavy ball and a light ball at the same time, the heavy ball or the big ball will drop faster. And, but uh, Galileo found that actually that's not true. Uh, but Aristotle just thought this is common sense, so I don't need to test it. You know, he didn't get up from his sitting under the tree. Um, and so that physics was the easiest one to test. And so that was the first science to become established. And then chemistry and then 
uh, some of the other sciences because then you could you can test things. But there are what we call the special sciences, which are the more difficult things because things are not so predictable. You know, so like with a, a rock, I can drop a rock and it will always fall exactly the same speed uh, every time I drop it. But with biological sciences, with social sciences, it's not like that. Um, it's not predictable in the sense that you're going to get the same outcome every time you do something uh, because of, you know, variability in the, in the way the body processes things, differences between people. So that's why, you know, you know, when you read medical literature, you know, today they say eggs are bad for you. Then tomorrow they say eggs are good for you. And then they, there's all of this back and forth because the, the kind of tests you run, you know, you might have different kinds of participants. So a lot of the early studies, they just did it on white males. And so now when they do it on like Asian females, they find completely different results. Um, so there's, there's all kinds of variables involved. In fact, this, the, the, the characteristic of the special sciences is there's so many variables, it's very hard to get a, a grip on it. Now that doesn't mean you can't do it, it's just what we call complex, complexity science or com more complex science. So you have to find ways of kind of controlling for all these different variables. It's, it's just harder than the simple sciences. And so that's why, you know, the later, the ones that come out later, like linguistics, you know, they're, were younger, been much more difficult to do. Uh, but that doesn't mean it's not possible, it's just harder because you have to control for more variables. And so that's why you're taking sociolinguistics with Ivan, right? So you talk about all these variables like age, um, gender, uh, socioeconomic background, all of these different things affect how you speak, right? So there isn't just, it's not like in chemistry where I take this chemical and this chemical and every time I put those two together, you're gonna get exactly the same output. So it's in, in anything like linguistics, you have to control for a lot of variables. And so we're still kind of a young science trying to figure out how to deal with that, all of that. And we, we're, we're making progress, but um, uh, it's still gonna take some time. And so there's lots for you to do <laughs> if you become professional linguists. Okay. Um, How can you tell whether a group is embedded or not? Like my hat with the feather in it is embedded, but isn't the embedded phrase expressing a circumstance? So shouldn't it be elaborating instead of an embedded phrase? Again, we go back to our mantra, which is think about the meaning. Think about what is it doing? What's the function of when you say something like my hat with the feather in it, what is with the feather in it doing? Or someone else just asked me something, uh, uh, you know, when you have the dog that's trained, that's easy to train. So when you, you think about what is it doing, it was helping you to describe or identify which hat or which dog or, you know, and so then it's going to be a modifier of that noun, right? So when you say that the, my hat with the feather in it, you're trying to say, okay, don't get the hat that doesn't have a feather, get the hat with the feather. So it's helping you to identify which hat. And so then when you think about that meaning, then you know it's gonna be a post modifier or a, a qualifier in there. And in this case, with a preposition phrase, but it could be a clause as well. Um, you know, get my, the hat that I left on the counter there. So it's just, again, the same, same thing. Whenever you're trying to figure out what something is doing, just think about the meaning, because the meaning is the use. The use is the meaning. And so think about, okay, what is, what is the meaning here? Is it modifying this thing? Is it helping me to identify this thing? Okay, then it's gonna be embedded. If not, if it's part of the clausal meaning, then it's going to be, you know, a, a, a circumstantial at the, at the clause phrase or something like that. A lot of people asked about she forgot to bring the keys or he forgot to bring the keys. Why is that um, a circumstantial kind of thing? And uh, all of these were just alpha and beta. And in this case, the, um, uh, the reason is because when you say she forgot to bring the keys, it's not that even though it's written this way, alpha, beta, it's actually the circumstantial meaning is within the first element. So forgot to bring the keys is giving you the reason why she doesn't have the keys, uh, basically. That's, at least that's Halliday's analysis of it. So the question here was, does it mean that to bring the keys is the reason for forgetting? No, it's the other way around, that forgetting is the reason for not bringing the keys. Um, But in, the, in those kind of uh, group complexes, it's always just alpha, beta. And a lot of people asked, what does gamma do? You know? uh, where, where does gamma come in? Okay, 
Well, it's just whenever you have a third modifier of this, right? So if you have, um, if you have some, if, if this is modifying this, and this, is, and it doesn't matter whether it's closed level or whether it's within, uh, you know, a, a group or a group complex. It, if it's each of these is independent modifiers, then it's going to be alpha, beta, gamma, delta, whatever, whatever. But if it's a different one, <coughs> like, um, and then this one is a, is an alpha itself, then this would be beta, beta. For some people ask me, why do you get this beta, beta? Uh, <clears throat> so it, what this means here is that this one is modifying this one, and this one is modifying that one. So uh, basically what this means actually is these two together are modifying this one, but this one is kind of has this internal structure. Uh, so like, um, uh, if it rains, oh no, um, she brought an umbrella. If it, we had an example like this. Uh, she brought an umbrella in case it rained, which would have been a problem for her. So there, the second one is modifying the first one, uh, which is then modifying the, the one before that. Uh, so that's when you use the double, double beta uh, when it refers to, to this one. And that can get very complicated, as in the, um, the example I just gave you with the, uh, we just had this example here with the grammatical metaphor. Oh, not that one. No, I don't want that. I don't want that. Cancel, cancel. Oh, okay. I'll use this, whatever. Um, Oh, here. So here, whoops, now this is very messy. So with this one, so we have a, um, where this, um, the president has the authority to send troops abroad. So that's the one although Congress must approve all declarations of war, so that's we have this one, um, and then this one, um, that does not stop the president of, uh, if he wants to send troops to fight overseas. So here we have this one, the second part of this one, two, uh, and then this one is being modified by both this beta and by this gamma. So with hypotactic clauses, they don't necessarily all come in direct order. So you could have had, uh, you know, this at another after this, or you know, if if they're in in one order, then it's it's still going to be alpha, beta, gamma. But even if they're not in the same order, it's still alpha, beta, gamma. So this beta is modifying this one, and this gamma is also modifying this one. But I was looking for an example of the double thing. Where'd it go? Ah, yeah, again, this stupid thing. So, so here's a simple one where if he does come, which is very unlikely, he will have to sleep in the barn. So this is the main clause, and then you have these two subordinate clauses, but this one, uh, together they're actually modifying that, but this one is modified by this one. So you've got, um, you know, either you could say this one is modifying this, and then this one is modifying this. So this B represents the B to this one, and this B is the same as this B. So it just means these two are linked together. 
Um, It's the same kind of thing. Okay, I don't have any really good examples then. All right, so actually I don't have any other good examples of that, but basically I hope you get the idea. Um, uh, one of the questions was when you have a clauses of paratactic relations linked together with just commas, like I came, I saw, I conquered, um, are the semantic relation between the clauses considered as extension or enhancement? And a lot of people asked that what is the difference between elaboration and enhancement or extension and enhancement? Again, I'm all, what is the meaning? Uh, so if the meaning is somehow uh, just elaborating on it, just saying more about the thing, then it's going to be elaboration. And you can think of it, and there's a, uh, appendix three in the book. There's a, three appendixes in the book. One is, appendix one is just a, a full analysis of one natural text called the silver text. So if you look through that, it's a, it does more than we ever did. Uh, but anyway, it, it's, so it looks really crazy but it's, uh, it, you might get some insights from it. The second one is about the grammar of small texts, which is kind of interesting, you know, analyzing things like headlines and what gets lost when you do a headline, right? So you, you drop the finite, you drop certain modifiers, things like that. So it's kind of interesting to see how that, and also think about that in terms of uh, Singlish. But um, then the third one is about the relationship of these kind of things like uh, uh, in elaboration, enhancement, uh, elaboration, extension, and enhancement to the, re the relational processes. So he talks about, it's just a short note, um, uh, talking about how basically elaboration is the, re is the intensive relational process. So this is this, right? So when you say um, something that's, that's kind of more of elaborating type, you're really just adding some information about that same reference. You're not adding any new reference. You're not giving any kind of circumstantial meaning. So it's just like if you say Sally, Sally is pretty, you're just giving more information about Sally. So it's, he equates this in elaborating type with a relational pro, an intensive relational process. And then the extension process, he, he, he uh, compares to the um, possessive type of uh, relational process, uh, not the intensive type, but in basically you're adding something to it. So when you say he has a piano, it's like you're adding a piano to him. Uh, so in this case, he's, he's saying one way to think about this elaboration versus extension versus uh, an enhancement is in terms of these relational processes. So the elaboration is the intensive one. The extension is the um, possessive one. And then the circumstantial one is, of course, the circumstantial, the enhancement. So enhancement is always going to be a circumstantial meaning. So the circumstantial meanings, the when, where, how, why. Uh, so anytime the meaning of the thing that you're talking about it has one of these senses of when, where, how, and why, then it's going to be circumstantial. So in this case, I came, I saw, I conquered. That's three different actions, right? It's not just elaborating on one thing. It's you're saying, I did this, then I did that, then I did this, right? So it's not marked overtly as a enhancing type relationship. So it doesn't say, I came, then I saw, then I conquered. So in this case, it's not overtly, you know, I did this, then I did this, then I did this. So you can just do that as an extension. So in some cases, I can see the, the how it's not so clear, the difference. So it's the difference between and, which is extension, and, and then, which is enhancement, uh, because it involves this temporal, uh, you know, when you did it. So in this case, I came, I saw, I conquered would just be straightforwardly extension, because it's three different, uh, so I did this, and then I did, and, and I did this, and I did that, because just having a comma just implies uh, 
um, you know, it, it, it's not, it, it's not, you could think of it as, as an enhancement in the context, but it's not overtly marked that way. Um, somebody asked, what is zero anaphora? Um, zero anaphora just means when the anaphoric, so-called anaphora, the reason this is metaphorical actually, when we talk about anaf zero anaphora, because zero anaphora really means there's nothing there, right? It's zero, zero means nothing. But it, it's claimed to be an anaphora, but an anaphora is, is usually there's something there, like that or it or, you know, uh, some other anaphoric element. Uh, but it, when we say zero anaphora, it means you just haven't mentioned it. It's basically what, what Halliday talks about as uh, ellipsis. So, you, so ellipsis is another way of just talking about, or zero anaphora is just another way of talking about ellipsis of pronouns. Uh, like in the case of, you know, he got up in the morning and washed his teeth, uh, brushed his teeth. Uh, so uh, the, the missing subject of the second clause, that's a zero anaphor and some, some theories call that a zero anaphor. We don't talk about it that way here. Uh, we talk about that as ellipsis. Um, for clause complexes, is it true that any idea that has not yet happened will remain as a projection? Yeah, I mean, Halliday makes a distinction uh, in terms of whether the action has happened or not. So with projection, it hasn't definitely happened, but with, with uh, expansion, it's happened. So there's this aspect to it in terms of distinguishing a projection from an expansion. Uh, and basically, a group complex is made up of a few groups. Yeah, that's the why it's called a complex, because it's a group complex, because it's uh, got uh, two or more groups. Um, uh, another thing, uh, the, when you have a quoted thing, like then it wasn't very civil of you to offer it, said Ang Alice angrily. These are, when you have a direct quote like that, that's going to be paratactic. So each of those is a separate clause operating at the clause level. The one of them does not act as a complement for the other. There are some theories that will treat that as a complement, but it's not a complement. It's a direct quote is seen as just standing by itself. And then the quoting phrase, the, par the projecting phrase is stands by itself. I mean, you, could, you wouldn't say it alone, but it's, it's, they're equal in terms of their you know, being paratactic, they're both equally part of what the person is saying. That's, I guess, the best way to think about it. Whereas with hypotactic, they're not equal, right? So the difference between hypotactic and paratactic, I mean, I said that a quick and dirty way of distinguishing them is if you can say them by themselves. But in, in the case of these quoting things, it's really the idea is that both are being said with the equal status. Whereas with hypotactic, they're not, they don't have equal status in terms of the message, what is being said. How do we identify between a rank shifted clause and an embedded one? Those are actually the same thing. Uh, so you don't have to distinguish them. Uh, rank shifted and non rank shifted, again, the, the, to distinguish those is what is it doing? So like in the case of, you know, the man who just came in, who just came in is a rank shifted clause. Um, but or you say that George Bush is an idiot uh, is obvious to everyone. That George Bush is an idiot is a rank shifted clause. So again, it just goes back to what is the meaning? What is it doing? What is its function? So if its function is to act as an argument for another process, then it's rank shifted. If it's standing alone by itself, then it's not rank shifted. It's acting at the clause level. Um, so it's, again, it always just goes back to what is it doing? Uh, what is it doing here? If it's acting as an argument or a modifier of, it's either an argument of a process or the modifier of some noun group, or noun, then it's going to be rank shifted. If it's standing on its own, then it's not rank shifted. It's just acting at the clause level. Um, how do you cut up the clause for groups and clause complexes? Um, can we do it like maximal bracketing? We never use maximal bracketing in this uh, theory. The, basically, again, you kind of go by the meaning. So you say what things go together. I mean, of course, if it's a written text, you have punctuation. And in spoken text, you have intonation. So you kind of listen for the intonation. And Halliday talks about this a little bit, although we didn't, we didn't have enough time to cover intonation in his, um, in his chapter about uh, uh, complexes. 
he does talk about how one of the ways of identifying the difference between them is, is the intonation contour. So they, you have different types of intonation contour depending on um, you know, the, the, what goes together and what doesn't go together, and, and sometimes even affecting the function. So there's no um, clear, you know, hard and fast mechanical procedure. It's all about saying, okay, what is this doing? Well, you know, what is, what is the function of this? Do these, do these things go together? Uh, or not. Um, yeah, someone asked, does it have to be, you can have alpha, gamma, beta, or does it have to always be alpha, beta, gamma? Um, they, it, uh, normally, if they're all on the same side of the alpha, then they would be alpha, beta, gamma. Uh, that's normally the way we, we do it. Uh, but if they're on either side of the one, like the example I gave you, then they can, you can have gamma on one side and beta on the other or vice versa. Um, and a lot of people said they were really happy about the cohesion one. That was very nice. A lot of people, one person even said it's the first lecture they actually understood most of. Um, so that's always good to hear, I guess. <laughs> uh, but yeah, cohesion is, is something that's pr prevalent and you know, per pervasive within our, our way of talking. So it's important to understand how that works. Um, How do you tell a difference between embedded locution and embedded expansion? With the expansion, the, the embedded modifier, post modifier or qualifier, whatever you call it, is helping you to identify the, the dog, like say for example, the dog with the, um, uh, with the, the red collar or something like that. Then it's helping to identify the element. Whereas with the, um, uh, embedded projections, the head noun is, is just a, it's first of all, the, the head noun is going to be a nominalization of a verbal process, something like decision, the decision uh, to do this, or the, um, uh, the agreement, or whatever. You know, it's going to be some kind of verbal process, and it's often going to just be a characterization of the, the following clause, rather than the following clause being uh, characterization of the head. So, um, you know, when you say the man who came in, the who came in, it characterizes the man. When you say the agreement we just made, then, uh, then the, the, we ju the agreement characterizes what we just made as an agreement. So it, it actually works the other way. So again, back to our mantra, just think about the meaning, think about what it's doing, uh, it's, they're kind of doing different things in that case. Um, oh, this was an interesting one. That sometimes you don't have a projecting clause, you just have a quote like, John stood from his chair, quote, did you eat the last slice of pizza, unquote. Uh, would this be considered projection direct quote? In this case, John stood from his chair is not projecting. Again, think of the meaning. The meaning is John stood from his chair. It's not John said, did you eat the last slice of pizza? It's, these are two separate things. But, you know, John standing from his chair, you could have said John stood, for, stood from his chair and said, did you eat the last slice of pizza? But you can leave these things out in a written text uh, or even in a spoken text if you kind of change your voice a little bit. Um, uh, you know, that we often do that when we're quoting somebody, we change our voice so, it sound, so it's obvious that it is a quote. Uh, but in a, a written text, you could do that. John stood from his chair, quote, he, did you eat the last slice of pizza? So you know it's something he said after standing up from his chair. But it doesn't mean that he stood up from his chair is a projecting clause. It's just another clause. So this would be um, one plus two, basically, um, because they're just two things that he did. So he did this and he did that. Right? But it's, in this case, it's, uh, it's, it's a... It's a it's a projected clause, but it's not projected by that clause. So that's, yeah, it's a complicated question there. Um, hey, how do we fit the, the analysis of the group complexes with the clause complexes? Um, 
I mean, it's the same kind of thing. It's just different uh, levels. So looking within the grouped complexes or the, and then within the clause complexes. So they're, they're done together uh, alongside each other. And is there a way to accurately pick out groups within a clause? Again, just seeing what they're doing. So if they're working together within a single clause, like John and Bill, or you know, the guy who just came in and the other woman who just left actually know each other. So that, that first part, the guy who just came in and the woman who just left. So that's all one big participant in just left. Uh, so you, again, you just look at what they're doing and if those two are together doing something, then it means it's one participant within the clause level. Um, and the same thing with the processes. If you, you look at, um, if it's a verbal group, you just look, is it one process, you know, like um, begin doing or help doing, or is it two processes? Um, Do we have to actually analyze all layers of a complex clause during the finals in the text analysis of our chosen text? Or do we just do an analysis on the biggest layer in the, as in the tutorial levels for tutorial seven? No, each of the tutorials, we just isolated one bit, but in your text analysis, you should do it all, right? So it's, uh, it, it, look, at the, look at the text at the end in a, um, the silver text in the appendix one, and you'll see what a full-blown analysis looks like. Although he's got uh, lots of stuff in there that we, I'm not going to ask you to do in your analysis. You don't have to do reference and uh, grammatical metaphor if you don't want. It's just too difficult to mark, really. Uh, well, the reference you can mark, but the grammatical metaphor is too difficult to mark um, because there's no one, you know, one direct right answer. Um, So again, somebody asked, you know, why is the group complex quickly and without a second thought, one plus two and not one equals two, because it seems to be like silently without a sound. Now you tell me, why are those different? Why is quickly and without a sound different from silently without a sound? Huh? One what? Yeah, so in the first one, you're talking about two different things. One is talking about speed and sound. The other one, they're both talking about sound. So it's just elaboration. That's why the second one is elaboration and the first one is extension because you're talking about two different things in the first one. Um, well, this one I answered already. Is collocation subjective? So from last week's, uh, we talk about this collocation, how things are, are, you know, due to frequently appearing together, they create certain frames, right? So is this uh, based on differences in culture? Yes. So, you know, if you are, um, you know, within a particular culture, certain things are going to go together and certain things are not necessarily going to go together or may not exist at all in that culture is a way of talking about it. So, um, you, um, uh, you know, it depends on how you break down, first of all, how your culture breaks down a particular event. Like say, for example, in Chinese, there are many aspects to Ming or fate. Uh, you know, so you can, you yuan wu fen, or you you yuan fen. You know, you have different parts of fate. And so they can, they kind of activate each other. Whereas in English, we just have the word fate and we don't even use it. Um, because we don't really have this whole concept of fate that the Chinese have. So it's very much contextually, that's just one aspect, one a kind of more abstract one, but even within concrete things like in cooking. So like say you go into a kitchen, um, what are the things you expect in a Chinese kitchen versus say what are the things you expect in a Western kitchen? They're gonna be very different, right? As I talked, um, like say for example in, in um, 
In Hong Kong, the, the kitchens are always closed kitchens and they often have a maid's room inside and they will also be a, um, a fan, a fan, like Cho Yu Yenti, um, a, an exhaust fan. And so these have to do with the nature of Chinese cooking and also the fact that most people in Hong Kong in large enough apartments will have a maid. Um, at, whereas opposed to say Australia, where the kitchens are open plan um, and they won't have an exhaust fan, they will have only an oven, which Chinese kitchens often don't have an oven. So they will have an oven because they make a lot of roasts. And then the open plan kitchen means that the kitchen it doesn't have a door, it's just part of the living room. It's kind of usually there's just like a counter in between. And so you have this, that way the, the, the person cooking can talk to the guests in the living room at the same time as they're cooking. Even if it's very big, it's still open, what we call open plan. So when you talk about the kitchen in a Western context, you can talk about the oven or the, you know, the counter or whatever, uh, when you mean this kind of counter that separates the, uh, the living room from the kitchen. Whereas in a Chinese kitchen, you can talk about the exhaust fan or you know, maybe some, you have a special stand for your wok or something. Uh, uh, so yeah, even just having a wok, a Western kitchen won't necessarily have a wok, you know, a, a uh, Chinese style cooking pot. So all of these things, these are parts of what we talk about as these semantic frames or schemas. And so when you mention one thing, then all of that gets activated. I mean, as, as we get with globalization, it becomes more and more all the same. I mean, this is one of the aspects of globalization that we all end up having the same way of thinking about stuff, which is kind of sad, but um, people think this is a good thing that we all become the same rather than each, each culture being uniquely different. And even within China, you know, when I first started going to China, like in 1976, parts of China were really very different from each other. And so, you know, the way you celebrated a holiday was different. So like Guonian, uh, you know, like uh, Chinese New Year, if you celebrate in Fujian and you celebrate in Beijing, it was completely different. Now it's all kind of globalized within China. So there's now like one Chinese culture. Whereas before there was no one Chinese culture. There was many different kinds of Chinese culture, different architecture, different ways of speaking, different ways of, um, you know, uh, celebrating events. All of these things were different. And now it's all become kind of just homogenized so, uh, but in the past, you know, you would have, you know, ha wouldn't have the same kind of shared um, collocations. So these are very much um, culturally based. And does that mean that a text can be totally cohesive without being coherent? Um, normally, you, it's not going to be coherent if it's not cohesive. I mean, these are kind of, coherent and cohesive actually mean the same thing. Co here and hesive is the same word. So cohere and cohesive to adhere and uh, it comes from the same root to adhere, adhesive. Um, so this really means the same thing. So you can't have one without the other. Uh, and what is the difference? A couple of people asked this. What is the difference between substitution and referencing? So substitution is kind of uh, the way Michael Halliday talks about it is as a replacement for some wording but not reference to the same element. It's kind of, you have to think of what we said before, but it may, and it may not be the same, um, the same exact reference. So when you do reference, you're referring to the same reference in a different way, right? So John bought a book and then he read it. So the it is referring to the same thing that the book, the word the book is referring to. Whereas when you are using substitution in some cases, like um, I bought a book and so did John. So the so there doesn't mean that um, the same thing as, it, it means I bought a book, not John bought a book, right? So John bought a book and so did I means, and I also bought a book. So it's, it means something similar, but not exactly the same. It's not referring to the same thing the way uh, references. Um, Do cohesive conjunctions and conjunctive adjuncts serve the same function? Um, I think the, the, yeah, so what, when I gave you that list of cohesive, of conjunctive adjuncts, and I gave you, said this is kind of like and, and this is kind of like, uh, and then that was just giving you the meaning. And they do the same thing in terms of uh, creating cohesion. 
but cohesive, the conjun conjunctions actually create a different grammatical structure, whereas the conjunctive adjuncts don't. So functionally, they do the same thing in terms of the meaning, linking the meaning <coughs> in a particular way, but grammatically, they do, they're different only in terms of conjunctions actually create a, a clause complex, whereas the conjunctive adjuncts don't. Um, what is a possible reason for using anaphoric, cataphoric reference in a sentence? Um, well, it's just you don't want to keep saying the same thing over again. Uh, now, cataphoric reference is not as common. And it's, it's really, I was thinking about this when I read it. You know, when you say, after John left the office, he went home. Or after he went home, John left the office. So the first one is anaphor. The second one is cataphor. Um, what's the difference in feeling between that? So after he left the office, John uh, went home. So that would be cataphor. After John left the office, he went home. Now, the, normally, the, the only place that you get this cataphoric reference is in, an, in a hypotactic clause like when he went home. Uh, so when he went home, John did. Now, the only reason I could think of for doing that is in order to have the main reference in the main clause, right? So the main reference to John in the main clause, because the, the uh, hypotactics clause is pronounced in a kind of less emphatic way. So, you know, when he went home, John did this, you know. So there's more of a stress on the main clause, and so it's going to be clearer um, who you're talking about if you put the, the noun phrase there. That's the only thing I can think of. Um, and, and like I said, it only occurs in these uh, hypotactic clauses. So it may, be, it may have something to do with that. Um, during the lecture, you mentioned the different varieties of English, British, American, Australian, English, whatever. Um, which variety should we use as some examples? You gave us sound like American English. Well, yeah. Um, there is a lot, I mean, I, I complained that, uh, not complain, I, I mentioned that uh, American, British, and Australian English are quite different in, in some ways. At least I was shocked. I moved, you know, I, I grew up in America and, and then I moved to uh, Australia in uh, 2004. And I was really blown away by how much I couldn't understand, uh, especially in the academic context. They have a whole different set of vocabulary for talking about things. So, like, what, what they call um, invigilating an exam, we call proctoring an exam, um, or uh, um, what, when we, um, like here they talk about moderating things. That just doesn't work in American English at all. Uh, moderate means to change something, but I guess that's what you end up doing when you moderate. But what they mean by moderate is meaning to look over and check that it's all kind of okay, because uh, we will moderate each other's exams before we give them. And that just means looking it over. It doesn't really mean changing it. Um, or kind of controlling it, I guess. I don't know. I'm not, you see, a lot of these things I don't even understand because they're not part of my original culture. Uh, but the, so the examples we make, but there is a lot of stuff that we do agree on. We can talk to each other largely. Uh, once you make a little bit of accommodation, so you understand like school means something different in Australia than it does in America. So, it, so this is not a school in Australia. This is a uni. So NTU is not, you can't, you can't call NTU a school in, in Australia. You know, because like when I first went there, I was at La Trobe University, and I said, I'm going to go to school now. And they're like, why are you going to go to school? I said, I'm going to La Trobe. And they said, that's not a school, that's a uni, you know. Uh, and so when they talk about, like, I remember the head of my, uh, you know, I was in this research center, and the head would interview somebody, and he'd, they'd say, well, what have you done since, you know, talking to a grad student, they'd say, what, to an American grad student, and you ask him, what have you done since school? And he'd say, I'm still in school. And the guy said, no, you're not. You know, you graduated already some years ago. And, he, and then the American would be totally confused because Americans have never heard that a university is not a school. Um, but for the, for the Australians and the, I assume the Brits, the um, K to 12 is school and everything else is something else. So there are a lot of differences, but we do also, you know, supposedly it is the same language. So we can communicate to some extent. Um, it, it depends. It depends on the context. Uh, like, I don't know if you've ever heard the movie called A Crocodile Dundee. It's a, a, one of the first big Australian movies where this guy speaks an Australian-style accent, very heavy, what we call broad Australian. 
and I went to see it with my brother and my father. I had to translate the entire movie for them. It was really, really annoying because I had one on either side and he's like, what do you say, what do you say, what do you say? And I had to keep <laughs> explaining to them because I could understand Australian English better than they could. Anyway, uh, but most of the time we assume it's the same. And, and so the examples that Michael gives, he is a Brit who, grew, who worked in Australia for many years. So he's kind of borderline between the two. But uh, Australian English is closer to British English than American English. Um, and so the, my, my own way of speaking is going to be very American, although it's been kind of tainted or mangled up by being, living in Australia for a long time. So I would things like, say things like, have a chat to him, which is not American at all. You say, I will chat with him. Whereas in Australia, you say, have a chat to him, uh, or have a think about that, or have a lie down. Uh, Australians say these kind of things. Um, so uh, generally, what we're, in, what we're after is more this kind of standard British, Australian, American, kind of the common denominator among US, Australian, Britain. Although in my next course, next semester, I'm teaching a course on comparative, um, comparative linguistics, where I'm going to be looking at Singlish, American English, Chinese, maybe some other languages, and then comparing them and see how they differ, all from a kind of cognitive point of view. Um, Um, so one question was, how do we analyze cohesion? Uh, this is one person who said they loved today's lecture. Uh, it was really fun. Uh, how do we analyze cohesion? Do we state how the use of a specific reference is effective in achieving the purpose of the text? I mean, the way Michael, an Michael just does it is with a little arrow saying this is pointing back way and then saying what kind of reference it is. But yeah, I mean, the point is, um, when you're reading the text, you're, in your mind, you're connecting one part of the text with the other. Or, uh, and there are also um, you know, um, references to things outside the text, possibly. So getting, getting clear on what is referring to what. Uh, because very often, people make mistakes in, in terms of what's referring to what. So just kind of clarifying in your mind that, oh, this is referring to that. Um, and, uh, or if it's some kind of intertextual thing, it may be referring to something in another text. Um, oh, it's already 2.30. Uh, is it fair to say that embedding is usually defining in nature while the otherwise is usually descriptive in nature? Yes, if you're talking about clauses and a, a, a rank shifted modifier, you know, embedded, um, expansion is always going to be defining, whereas if it's operative on, the, on the, the main clause level, then it's not going to be defining, it's just going to be elaboration. So like my brother, who just came back from Chicago, something, something, something. So that, then that, that's a clause, that's a non-restrictive relative clause, operating at the clause level, elaborating a little bit on, about my brother. But if I say um, the guy who just came back from Chicago, then that's an embedded modifier, uh, an expansion, telling you who the person is, defining who the person is. OK, so that's all for today. Any questions, comments, questions, quickly? Sorry, I should have asked earlier. I lost track of the time. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.